Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 12. Today we're going to be talking about broadcast. Last time we talked about BGP routing. We uh, looked at the beginning of class about a problem in the distance vector algorithm called count to infinity where um, when a link gets uh, worse, in other words, and, or especially if, it, if the cost goes up or if the cost goes up to infinity, there can be a uh, really slow convergence in getting to the uh, right solution with this distance vector algorithm because there, there's this old information that's used continuously in a loop. Uh, we found that a solution to that was to use um, store the full path of that was being used in routing in those uh, tables or to uh, at least store the last hop if you're only concerned about uh, two node loops. The, uh, and then we moved on to talk about BGP. BGP is the border gateway protocol that's used by all the um, autonomous systems on the internet. Autonomous systems are groups of routers with one routing policy, but really you can think about them as organizations that are that form the internet that have big blocks of IP addresses given to them by the ICANN. So these are like uh, ISPs and uh, large companies. And routing on the internet is hierarchical in the sense that at the top level, BGP is used to decide which autonomous system packets travel through to reach a destination. And then, but then within an autonomous system, an interior gateway protocol or IGP is used to determine the optimal route within that autonomous system. Uh, a link state algorithm can often be used inside of an IGP uh, of an AS, for example, uh, using Dexter's algorithm. But as I said before, the BGP is used to determine routes between autonomous systems to solve this big uh, problem. The reason why the internet routing is done hierarchically is because the internet is too big. There are too many routers to solve one big shortest path problem. There'd be too many changes, so we kind of like abstract it to a higher level. Uh, BGP solves the shortest AS hop count when it's determining uh, routing paths, determining routes, which is not really necessarily the optimal, so there's some mechanisms to get around that, like to have local preference to hard code certain choices. And then we looked at how a BGP advertise, at the details of a BGP advertisement, and this is the equivalent of a distance vector that's advertised in a distance vector uh, to, to neighbors. So a BGP advertisement is sent to your neighbors. It tells your neighbors um, what destinations you can reach, and those destinations are specified as prefixes. So they're basically a whole chunks of IP addresses instead of just single nodes in the, that we looked at in the abstract. What path uh, of autonomous systems is traveled through to reach that destination, and what the next hop is, what the IP address is of the router that a message should be sent to to reach that destination. So by sending a BGP advertisement to a neighbor, you're not only telling you about telling the neighbor about what locations you can reach, but also um, what destinations you're willing to forward packets to. So you're telling your neighbor, I can reach this destination, and if you send me the packets to those destinations, that destination I will forward them there. Okay. Uh, so that was BGP. We kind of said it was the glue of the internet. Today we're talking about broadcast because it allows us to. Um, bootstrap the process, I guess. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that in, in a, a, a slide or two. First of all, I want to kind of zoom out and kind of break down some of the assumptions we have made so far in networking. So far, we've talked about what's actually called unicast addressing. This is uni meaning one. Um, this is where we're sending a packet to just one address. So we have a single destination address in every packet. And the internet and the internet protocol, IP networks, were really designed for unicast. Applications have more general needs than that, and that's where I think there's the internet doesn't quite um, meet every need for communication because of the, the, the fact that it's built around unicast. So the, these diagrams kind of show just conceptually some alternatives to unicast. Unicast is when you have a message going from the red source to the screen destination. There are other uh, nodes that are, are not getting the message. Anycast is a generalization where you have a set of nodes that you want to send the message to any one of them. Uh, we'll see how this is, is actually sometimes used in practice. Broadcast is where you have a message that you want to go to every node. We'll also talk about this today, although uh, it, it doesn't actually 
apply to the whole internet, but we'll see where the, where we can use this. And multicast is, is kind of a, com a blend between unicast and broadcast, where we have a message that we want to go to a set of nodes. So in this case, we're picking out three of them. Geocast is kind of a, sp a uh, specialization of multicast where we're choosing the nodes based on the geographic location. So we want to send no messages to um, all the nodes in a particular location. Okay, so those are some ways we can generalize the idea of packet addressing and packet delivery. And we're going to talk today about anycast, uh, broadcast, a little, little bit about multicast, mostly broadcast. Okay, so anycast, like I said, is when you have a packet that you want to go um, to any of a, a few, you have a choice of several different nodes. And actually, if you think about that, um, that's useful for load balancing, right? When you have uh, a service that needs to handle a lot of traffic, you have all these red customers uh, coming in that want to talk to, to your service. You have many duplicate copies, these green nodes, and it doesn't matter which of the servers your uh, the customer connects to as long as the servers are all kind of running the same code and have access to the same data. Um, having some kind of like any cast mechanism is a way to implement load balancing. And there's a, kind of a hack you can do with uh, with IP to implement AnyCast, even though IP wasn't designed for AnyCast. And this is done in particular for the IP address 8.8.8.8, .8 also for the root uh, DNS servers. I mentioned there are 13 root DNS servers. Um, those 13 addresses and also this 8.8.8.8 .8 address, which is the um, Google public DNS server that it allows clients to connect to. Those are IP addresses that need to handle a lot of traffic. So they're actually, what you want they want to do is have many machines accepting traffic that's going to this one IP address. Okay, I call this a hack because it's not really like built in, it's not, it wasn't intended, we're using IP, the IP protocols in a way that it wasn't intended for to accomplish this destination. And basically the way this works is that we have different border gateways, which is to say routers, advertise short routes to this particular destination. Um, and around the world, traffic will be routed to which, whichever one of those multiple border gateways uh, is closest. So like normally the way that IP addresses are discovered, the way traffic flows to an IP address normally is that it's inside of an AS and that AS does a BGP advertisement telling the world that it that within itself it has certain IP addresses, right? With hop count zero, let's say, like the, this is within my um, autonomous system, and then the world that information is propagated throughout the world. But you can you can twist that uh, um, procedure and have um, if you have presence around the world, you can have multiple locations around the world telling their neighbors that the same IP address is uh, located kind of within those different locations. Okay, so this picture shows, whoops, this picture shows AS3 and AS2 both claiming IP address 8.8.8.8 .8 and both advertising to their neighbors that they have a zero hop route to get there. Okay, so the neighbors will, will listen, will uh, kind of obey or believe, let's say, Neighbors will believe that information in the advertisement and, and send traffic there. So if a router is closer to, to this one, it'll send traffic there. If a router is closer to this one, it'll it'll send traffic there. So machines over in this uh, right-hand side of the network will send their 8.8.8 .8 traffic to this location here. But perhaps on this left-hand side, because they're closer to this other AS, it's also advertising kind of the same thing the same closeness to this IP address, it'll send traffic here. And once it gets inside this network, of course, both of these uh, networks will send the traffic to whatever machine they have assigned that IP address. So you have, we have two machines that are both kind of using that IP address. And you have two autonomous systems that are both advertising that IP address. So that works in the sense that both of those machines will get that traffic. Um, but that's bad if, if, uh, someone else, if, if you actually, if one of the organizations really is the company that owns that IP address, that was assigned that IP address by the ICANN and the other AS is just a rogue actor that is trying to maliciously take over another AS's IP address. That would be, that's called BGP hijacking when that happens. 
um, and that that is kind of possible. Uh, BGP does not really have mechanisms to prevent false information from spreading. Um, you have these, this network of tens of thousands of autonomous systems that actually do all trust each other. Um, there are not so many of them that there has been a strong need so far to um, mistrust and validate the information that's being advertised by autonomous systems on the internet. Okay. But getting back to the example of, let's say, Google, um, Google, I don't know offhand whether whether they have one autonomous system or multiple autonomous systems, but regardless, it, let's say it's that the one autonomous system that spans the whole world basically has connectivity around the world, then they would advertise all around the world that they have this IP address available, and then inside their network they would route it to one of several different copies of, of different machines that are like operating that IP address. Now, um, I have a homework question basically asking when this would fail uh, that I typically ask. And you could see that having two machines trying to operate the same IP address would not work well if you have more than one packet that uh, isn't that you need to send and receive. If you have a whole flow of communication with that machine, if you start talking to one with a TCP connection and suddenly you get switched over to the other one for some reason, the other machine would have no record of what you previously said. So like, you know, if you're building a an HTTP message out of a TCP stream that would that would fail, right? If you're just sending one packet at a time, like using a UDP protocol such as DNS, like DNS usually only involves one packet sent, one packet received. That's the perfect use case for IP uh, anycast. Although in practice, I think a lot of services do use IP anycast for load balancing of even TCP traffic because they assume that you're not that users are not going to get cut over halfway between connections because um, generally it's the, the routes uh, are pretty stable worldwide. Okay, so uh, that was IP anycast. IP multicast. Remember, this is this is where we're sending um, traffic from one machine to a set of machines. That's useful uh, if you have like a broadcast, like someone who's streaming video, let's say, to a bunch of, of listeners, right? Um, if you have, it's much better to uh, have one copy of the data sent and have it be replicated as it moves out instead of having to like have each of the clients connected and requesting the same data multiple times. There, there's an RFC that there's several RFCs that that add multicast support to IP. Uh, it's not very well supported. It's it's done through this mechanism called broadcast groups, where there's certain special IP addresses. Like this is an example of one right here, twenty two thirty nine dot one dot one dot one, that don't really identify particular machines, but identify broadcast groups, and hosts can subscribe to one of these addresses, like basically say, I want to listen to the traffic that's sent to this address using the IGMP protocol. And the routers involved in this have to remember, have to track which broadcasts are active. In other words, which ones of these IP addresses are being used and which of the neighbors are um, have, are, have asked to receive the traffic associated with that broadcast. So the routers need to know to which neighbors they should forward all this multicast traffic. If you think about this, this is kind of like adding a layer of um, control, of routing control, to the routers in addition to what BGP is already doing. So, uh, but with even more fine granularity, because individual hosts, like individual clients, will um, perhaps join and leave these broadcast groups uh, frequently as they like tune into a video broadcast and leave a video broadcast. So that adds a lot of burden to the routers, and for this reason. Public internet routers that are support, you know handling tons of traffic with um, you know tens of thousands or if not hundreds of thousands of flows um, don't don't actually generally support IP multicast. This is optional. It wasn't part of the original um, IP v4 specification. So on the public internet, we don't have multicast. If you want to do like a YouTube live stream or something, generally all the clients because that's happening over the public internet, all the clients generally have their own one-to-one -one connection for unicast communication between YouTube and the client. So YouTube is sending like has multiple connections where it's sending the same data out to many users kind of inefficiently in a sense because it that could be going in the same direction and then being split up later. But there's some special scenarios where if you have um, 
an organization that's managing a campus or a building where there is a, a potentially a good use case from IP multicast where you might have routers that support it. So, uh, for example, in the hospitality industry, hotels, um, if they're using IP television, they, uh, they might have routers that support IP multicast so that all the TVs in the building um, that are watching the same channel can subscribe to that channel and then the router sends that sends one message uh, that gets kind of like redistributed to, to the rest. This could also potentially be be handled by set-top boxes like uh, that, that television companies might use to deliver um, television to cus to customers a lot. I'm not sure if it's if it's uh, if it's commonly used there. It could also be implemented on a campus. And again, these are all scenarios where you have a, a bunch of routers that are managed by one organization or a small number of organizations that have all like agreed to adopt this because across the public internet, um, there, there's not really agreement to use it. In these cases where IP multicast is used, uh, we typically always see UDP as a transport protocol, not TCP, uh, because if we were using TCP, we have a sender sending a packet that's going to, to thousands of receivers potentially. Um, you don't want the sender to have to track the acknowledgement status of a thousand different receivers, um, and have, you know. So, uh, IP television, you know, video broadcasting is a good use case for this because if a packet is dropped, it's not a big deal. You just have a slight blip in the video delivery, um, and if it's if it's not delivered, then re retransmitting it is not helpful anyway because you've already, uh, if it's live, then you've already lost the chance to to play the uh, video segment unless you have a lot of buffering. Okay, but that's all I'm going to say about multicast. We're going to spend the rest of the lecture talking about broadcast. And this is something that you need in project three. So uh, that's one reason uh, to pay attention. But broadcast in general is a, is a, it's a pretty important basic network building block. It's not supported on the internet actually. So IP does not support broadcast. Remember broadcast is when we have a single packet going to everyone else on the network. Now, I want you to stop and think about why the internet does not support broadcast. Just at a basic level. That's not a very complicated answer. What do you think? Well, if we did, then that meant that we, we would have a message. It would be possible to send a message to re that went to everyone on the internet. There are a lot of people on the internet. Um, there's no one message that's so important or so relevant that everyone would want to get it. Okay, so, so it's not supported, but you know, in a, in a small or moderate sized network, or some kind of private network, it can be useful, particularly in ad hoc networks. What I mean by an ad hoc network is uh, a network of neighboring hosts that connect without prior planning. So this is like a bunch of machines, like very often with wireless networking or that, that are in the same location that, that don't really that just uh, have shown up and, and want to communicate and they want to do that um, locally. I mean, local broadcasts are simple. If everyone is, is within range on our radio network, um, then, you know, everyone, if you send a message, everyone will get it. That's a broadcast by nature. I mean, wireless itself is kind of a broadcast medium. But if you want to do this over like multiple hops, then you need some kind of, uh, it becomes a network because the people on the far end of the of this ad hoc uh, community can't reach each other with their signals. Ha that signal has to be, the message has to be forwarded by hosts in between. But these are, again, hosts that just showed up without prior planning, so they have to somehow uh, share information and coordinate routing. This is called uh, mesh networking or mobile ad hoc networks or ad hoc networking. Those are all different terms for this. Um, an example of this, which you may or may not have seen, is, is Fire Chat, was a smartphone app that was kind of I had a little bit of a buzz uh, and was newsworthy a little bit between 2014 and 2018, although now it's shut down because I guess I didn't make any money. <laughs> but it's a peer-to-peer -peer chat app that doesn't use the internet uh, or it can operate without the internet using just like local communication mechanisms like Bluetooth or ad hoc Wi-Fi. So you could be at a, um, a music festival in the middle of the desert, let's say, and there's no internet connectivity, but there are you know, hundreds of people there. And if they're all running this app, they would be able to send broadcasts that reached other people running the app. And then they could kind of like discover 
what the network who who was what the nodes were available and build a map of how to uh, route traffic across the entire uh, event, right? Even from the far ends across multiple hops, okay, in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. Like I said, using Bluetooth or ad hoc Wi-Fi, no, without infrastructure. That's one way of looking at broadcasts. Another another place where broadcasts are useful is if you think about a network like the internet that is um, being set up by in a distributed way without coordination. So if we, we have machines that are connecting even with wired uh, connections and they only know about their neighbors in the same way, same way that with a, with a radio uh, ad hoc networking, you only can reach your neighbors. Um, you want to learn about the whole structure of the network and be able to send messages across the whole thing. But at first you don't, you don't have that information. You want, so you want to eventually get to uh, unicast routing. You want to have something like um, you want to have the internet. You want to have be able to put in an IP address and have that packet reach the destination. But before we can get there, all, we we don't have any information about the whole network. Uh, we might know what size the addresses are. You know that they're going to be 32-bit addresses, for example. Well, that doesn't tell us about how to how to route things. So you can start off by using broadcasts to reach your neighbors to learn about the structure of the network, and um, then eventually figure out the routes. Okay. So. In project three, we have a scenario, a simulator that gives you nodes that are meant to represent routers, but they're abstractly nodes that are, you know, in a network where they're connected to some neighbors and they can only, they can't see the whole, they don't know what's going on in the whole network. All they know is what links they have, who their neighbors are. They can send messages just to their neighbors. And somehow with that, in that distributed fashion, with that limited local view, you have to build um, a system that allows communication throughout the whole uh, throughout the whole network, right? So basically, you have to build uh, something like the internet, right? And and one way of doing it is with BGP, uh, something like BGP, which is a distance vector algorithm, right? And so there's one you have to implement that, and that involves a kind of broadcasting in a sense. It's not broadcasting in, in this sense because it's not sharing the same information, but sharing some information that's changed and modified. Another an alternative way of dealing with that distributed routing problem is uh, using the link state algorithm. And this is where the goal is to have every, every participant in a network learn what the entire network is, to get full information about the network. And But they don't have that initially. Initially, they just know about their neighbors. So what you do is you have every node flood its local information to the whole network. So it becomes a broadcast problem, right? Like, I know uh, who my two neighbors are, and I know about myself, and uh, so I have two edges that I, that I have information about. And if I can share those, the information of those two edges to everyone else in the network, and they can do the same to me, like they can share the information about all their edges, then I will, by the time this is done, have information, know what all the edges are in the network, which is to say I'll have a picture of, of the whole network. And then if I know what the whole network is, I can solve, I can use Dijkstra's algorithm or any algorithm to, to compute what the shortest paths are to figure out what direction to send things to get to the uh, final destinations. I'll, I'll know the whole path actually, even though it's not necessary, really all I need to know is what the next hop is, but um, I'll have that complete information. And again, that's what you'll do. That's one of the things you'll do in, in the third project. So, so that, that's what we're going to talk about here, how to f broadcast or flood information to a whole network. Okay. This is so. This is not so much about like. This is not really about a situation that resembles something real on the internet. This is um, this is uh, something you would encounter in a distributed system where there is not prior information about the structure, and that's true in our simulation of of the of a network like the internet. Okay, so with broadcasting, and we're using flooding as a synonym for broadcasting. We have a message that let's say it's starting at this node R1, and we want it to go to these, all these other nodes. Okay, if you did actually know the structure of the network, and you had information to share, you could you could take a message and you could compose three messages and address them to the three destinations R2, R3, and R4, and send that message out. Okay, so that, that's a, a, a naive approach or, or 
to a broadcast. And this is what actually kind of generally what has to happen on the internet when you have a service that wants to broadcast information to lots of clients. Because like I said, multicast is not generally supported on the internet. So for the case of YouTube live streaming, this is kind of what happens. Okay, you have, you have three different unicasts from the source to three different clients. Um, now, I want you to think about the downsides of this approach. Okay, what what's wrong with this? What could be improved if our goal is to transmit a message to these three clients? So stop and think about that. Okay, two problems that I can identify. So the first one is that you had to have prior knowledge of the network, like this R1 had to know three different addresses. If there was a uh, fifth machine that joined, fifth router that joined, R1 would have to learn that, uh, that, I, that IP address. And the second problem is inefficiency, right? This first hop has three duplicates of the message being transmitted over this link. The only difference is the destination address on that message is different, right? So it would be better somehow if we could send one copy of the message and have it be duplicated in transit before going out to the other destinations, right? So on the right hand side, I have a, a more efficient version of this where um, there are fewer bits sent, right? Like in the core of the network, in the sort of backbone, if we have duplication, we're, we're loading uh, we're sending more traffic than we need to, okay? But in implementing one of these broadcasts, we uh, need to make sure to get it right. It's not trivial to do this, okay? Because we need to make sure that all the nodes get the message, all right? We don't wanna, with the first, with the basic implementation, the way that was done was by knowing the IP addresses of all the destinations. That itself could be hard, but if you don't, if you're, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you want to make sure all the nodes get the message. You want to make sure that it's efficient, which is to say the message is received just once by all the nodes, not many times. And we want to make sure it's it that this process terminates. Um, if we'll see later on that if we don't, if we're not careful, and we're just propagating data through the network, uh, it could kind of get end up in loops where it's going on forever, right? So those are our goals with broadcasting, and I'll, I'll explain one way of doing it in this lecture. But I want you to actually stop and think about how you would implement broadcast. I think this is this would be a really helpful exercise because um, you'll probably come up with something that is almost right but maybe has has one shortcoming and, and we'll see why uh, how to fix that. So you assume that every node just knows about its neighbors and it's a big network with multiple hops and one of those nodes wants to send a message to everyone. Okay, so what should what should the first one do and what should everyone else do to implement that broadcast or that flooding? Okay. And again, you want, to, you want it to be efficient, you want it to terminate, you don't want it to go on forever, and you want everyone to get the message. Okay. And even if you can't come up with a full solution, what are, some, what are the challenges that arise in doing that? Right? There's a trade-off there, I think, between everyone getting the message on the one hand and termination, right? If, you, if you're uh, too stingy about sending messages, then not everyone will get the message, but if you're too overzealous in sending messages, it could be that you just keep repeating yourself in a loop, okay? So uh, the first strategy, and this is actually the strategy that you should implement in the link state algorithm in your project, this, this strategy is called controlled flooding, okay? So we, we flood, which means that when a message comes in, we send it out to all of the other neighbors, all, all the other links except for where it came in. So uh, nodes retransmit packets the first time they're seen by a node, but only the first time. And we have a way of tracking whether it was the first time we saw a message. Okay. Uh, we don't retransmit on the link that it came in on because obviously the other end of the link already got that message. So these first two steps, pretty simple, right? Message comes in, flood it out. But somehow the important thing is when the message comes back again later, we need to have some way to recognize that and not send it again to control the flooding, okay? And the way we do that is with by having a unique identifier on every message and by remembering all the recently uh, received messages. So we have to have some memory, we have to have some, we have to have some storage, some state on these nodes where we, we have a record of what messages we received recently so we don't retransmit, okay? Now, why would the message come back on this link? 
Actually, that's that's a good one to stop and think about. Why would a message come back on the same link? Uh, well, actually, it, it shouldn't come back on the same link. <laughs> That 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 maybe is a is a bad um, drawing, but it could come back from a different link if there's a loop in the network, right? Like if it went out this way, although we, we would have thought that it went out that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. If it actually it can come back on the same. It depends on the timing, actually. Yeah, L let me. Uh, I'll, I'll. I need to do the drawing to explain how this can, how this link message can arrive back on the same link. That's, that's kind of confusing at first. It's because of the um, asynchrony of this thing. If everything is synchronous, like if you send messages and everyone gets them, and there's no delay in transferring, then this this could not happen. All right, but to explain this in more detail, for this link state algorithm you're implementing for the project. Now remember, the purpose of that is to ha have all these distributed nodes learn a full representation of the network by, by sharing their edge information to all their neighbors and having that flood everywhere. Okay, So the met, the information that we want to send is, is the edge and that's that's represented, excuse me, that's represented by this uh, purple, green, and black uh, text, right? So the, li the link source, link destination, and link cost, that's like, that's the edge information, right? Source, destination, and cost. We add to that, though, a sequence number. Okay, so the sequence number starts off at zero the first time you have information about a link. But because links can change in our, in our simulation and in, um, in a real network, perhaps, we add the sequence number so that we can um, send updates for links when links change and have nodes uh, accept the new information as new information uh, but if they get old information, to be able to recognize it and throw it away. So these first three numbers, the link source, link destination, and sequence number, together uniquely identify the, the message. And if we see this combination again, we ignore it. If we see a lower sequence number than what we've already gotten, we ignore that as well. Okay. All right, so let's, let's do a little demo of uh, link state flooding and try to explain why we need sequence numbers and how messages can come back in a loop. Okay. So I'm going to do this with a pretty simple... Uh, example, but just to to review the uh, link state message that we are sending. Try to get this in focus. Uh, not quite. Let's try one more time. Yeah. Okay. The link state message that we're sending has uh, has four things, right? It's the source the destination, the sequence number, and the cost. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to underline the three things that have to be unique, that uniquely identify the message. And and the, this is going to be stored by, the, uh, by all the nodes that get it. Okay. So let's set up a little s scenario. The, I think this is kind of like a minimal scenario where we could have a problem where that's where it's somewhat interesting. So we have A, B, and we have two other nodes. Okay. So we have this link be updated or, or learned. This could be this could be the first time that it appeared, or it could be, um, it, or it could be. A change that happened. But in any case, when this link appears or changes, both of these nodes will notice that because they're both on the edge uh, uh, connected to it. Let's say that um, let's say that A sees the link first. Okay, so it sees that that the link A B has a cost of three, right? So A will broadcast a message with this information. It, record, it records this on its own record, but it also has to tell the whole network about this, right? Because we want everyone in the network to know about this edge. It broadcasts a message like this, right? So to build that out, uh, we can just say the source is A, the destination is B, the sequence number is zero, 
and the cost is three. Okay, so zero because it's the first edge, let's say, that we got the first time we're reporting information about three. Now, if there was another change, if this went up to four, then A would send a message where uh, the sequence number was one and it would have the, the new value of four there. So A also has to store this message. Because, and everyone who received this message has to store it because we want to um, have this message only propagate through the network once and at multiple time. So A stores this message as received. It just kind of like gives it to itself. And um, eventually A gets the message back. But when it does, it can ignore it. gets it back and ignores it because it has it has stored that record okay so b will get the b will get that message so the broadcast goes out this way it also goes out this way okay b will get this message it will record it so it will learn about this this uh edge AB. Maybe it, it, it maybe already knows about it, but uh, because it's connected to it, but let's say A saw the link first, and so maybe it, it uh, gets it the first time. But anyway, it'll propagate it out in this direction, in this direction, and then those nodes that get it will propagate it, and so on. So, But eventually, you know, the message is going to reach this node, perhaps, and come back to, the, to, to this node, to A. Now, why would A get its own message back? Um, it's true that this, if this node gets the message, it, this message from from A, it shouldn't rebroadcast. It should only rebroadcast it in the the new directions, not back in the direction it came. But if if somehow this message that was broadcast out by A in two directions arrives at B quickly, and is transmitted up here quickly so quickly that it, it outpaces the, the original that was traveling in this direction, then it's possible C will send the message back in this direction, right? Because it, it, if this is C, sorry, um, it has no, yeah, the, the pacing here, we should assume the pacing is adversarial, meaning any arbitrary pacing is possible on this network. In, in this distributed system. So to, that's one of the tricky things about designing distributed algorithms. You, you never really know what the timing is going to be. Or put, to put it another way, if the timing, if the delays are arbitra arbitrary, then you, you end up with a distributed system that's very difficult to, um, to reason about. I mean, it's not impossible, but you have to be, you have to be worried about these, wor worry about these edge cases. So C gets the message, sends it back. A will get that, and it will see that it already has a record, so it will we'll ignore it. Um, so the same, the same reasoning applies to updates. So you might ask, why do we need a sequence number? In other words, why, why do we bother to have a version number if, you know, if, if this link changes from three to four, A will, A will, A will send, um, an update, right? I'm going to put a sequence number with a new number. Now, where did I get this one? A has to, when A creates a message, records this value, it has to also, it has to remember that the zero was, it has to keep this counter and increment it. Um, okay. But anyway, so A sends this message with this new sequence number. Uh, if we didn't have it, of course, then, then the nodes that receive information could always uh, store it. If it was, and then if it if it if it looked new, they could retransmit. If it didn't look new, then they would not retransmit it. But without the sequence number that we could have, and if we have adversarial, if we have adversarial timing, it could be that the first message. I'm going to use red to indicate the first message. The first message could go this way and uh, this way to reach D. And the second message might, would let's say it goes that way. Uh, well, 
let's just use a different path. Erase some of these arrows. That was me that's message one, and, and let's say message one is is delayed. Sorry, message two is sent. Afterwards, it it, re it reaches B later, and it's sent up this way, and then it's sent this way. It's possible if, if the the delays on the links v vary over time that the second message could arrive here first before this one does. We we I mean. If the, if the network and the nodes operate in the exact same way every time, if the delays are always the same, and the delivery orders are always the same, then this won't happen. But if not, but if that's not true, if there's some variation in, in delivery times, then um, the second message could could arrive uh, first, and then so then D would see these sees four, then three, right? So it would think that the new value is new is the newest because it arrived later. Okay, so if we don't have sequence numbers, the problem is basically that the nodes use delivery time as a proxy for newness. Whereas in reality, the delivery time is not cannot reliably be used to to indicate the age. Just because something arrives later doesn't mean that it's newer. So what you do is you have sequence numbers on there and so when 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 D gets this this uh, second message first, it'll see a sequence number of one, and it'll say, great, well, that's kind of weird. I didn't get the message with sequence number zero, but I'm going to save it. And then it'll get the older message later. It sees a sequence number of zero, and it'll say, well, okay, I haven't seen this before, but it's older than the one I already have, so I'm going to drop it. Okay. All right. So that that's a summary of how to do link state flooding, as you'll need to do it in the project. There is another way to implement broadcasts in general um, instead of flooding, which is by using a spanning tree. Um, a spanning tree is a subset of edges in a graph that connects all the nodes but has no cycles. So this, this is an example of a graph, and the bold lines show a spanning tree. Now, it's, a tree means it has no, no loops, no cycles. Um, the, the benefit of this for broadcast is, and what, what I mean by using a spanning tree, I mean that if the message is, if you're, you're, if you're a node and you want to send a message to everyone and you know what the spanning tree is, then you send the message along the edges of the spanning tree and everyone uh, retransmits only along the spanning tree edges and not along the other edges. So if I'm in this position, um, let's say this position here uh, between the two and the three that I'm highlighting, so this node would send the message in only two directions, even though it has the capability of sending it in five directions. It would send it in these two directions. Uh, this one would stop because it's at the end. This one would send it again in two directions instead of four instead of four directions. Uh, it wouldn't send it backwards, and then so on, right? And this would reach all the nodes. There would be no possibility of looping because the tree doesn't have any loops, and it's efficient, right? Because there's no duplication of delivery. So in a sense, this is like a the best way to, to, to broadcast a message is to use a spanning tree. Actually, it's even more efficient than flooding because with flooding, we had to actually propagate backwards and we received we received one duplicate of all the messages. Um, in some cases, we received duplicates of messages. In this case, there's no duplicates of messages ever delivered. Okay. We have no need, there's no need to remember uh, message identifiers because we're not going to receive duplicates. But the, the trouble here, that the reason why this is not... Um, it's difficult to use this approach is because somehow these nodes have to find a spanning tree, they have to know about the whole network and they have to have use the same spanning tree. So all these nodes have to agree ahead of time to the same spanning tree. If they're using a different one uh, then that would the message would would perhaps not be delivered everywhere or would, be, or would it go in a loop. Okay. Like for example up here this, this node, this edge labeled 5 could have alternatively be chosen for the tr chosen for the tree instead of four, and if this node here thinks the five is on the spanning tree, then when this message if the message starts in the on the right and comes in and goes here, then this node will send it on the five, and then it ends up going in a loop, right? Because there's a confusion about what spanning tree edge to use. Um, 
So I'm going to spend a few slides talking about spanning trees. Again, this is not used in... This is useful in, in, in networks where you, you do have control about the whole network. It doesn't change a lot and you need like the most efficient way to do a broadcast, okay? But for the project and for like ad hoc networks, generally you you don't have the luxury of that information, so you don't use this approach. But let's go through this a little go through uh, this a little bit anyway just to learn about um, doing efficient broadcasts. Uh, finding a spanning tree is not terribly hard. Uh, you can come up with a very simple greedy algorithm that finds a spanning tree by just doing a depth first search or a breadth first search. By just choosing a node as long as it visits an unvisited, choosing an edge as long as it visits an unvisited node. Okay, so as long as you track the nodes that have been visited in some kind of a set, and ignore the edges that lead to those, you can you can find a tree that doesn't have a cycle. So doing a depth first search, I'm going to animate it from the root up here. You can choose that one for example. Then you keep just going depth wise, choosing edges that are that don't connect to someone you've already connected to. You might go this way, this way, this way. Um, here, once we get to C, we have a choice of two edges. Uh, if we're going depth first, if we, if we, if we, if four was the one that we that shows up in that depth first search, you, the algorithm can see that that connects to one of the nodes in the set that the tree already joined. So we ignore that one. I'm turning that dashed to show that that turned out to be an invalid choice. We don't choose that. So instead, we choose this one, and then we choose this one, and then. At that point, there's a bunch of edges available in the depth first search that are invalid. Finally, we find one that's valid, and now we have a tree. Okay, it's a very long, snaky tree, but it's still a tree, right? It doesn't have a cycle. It connects all the edges. It has, um, if there are v vertices, it has v minus one edges. Um, and just to, yeah, we finish it up by just checking the last edges. All the edges get ruled out. We can do the same thing in a, a breadth first search instead, and that just kind of like fans out instead of going deep. You go wide instead of deep, but the same basic rules apply. And we find a tree. Okay. These are both starting at the root. They're different trees, um, but they're, they're both trees, both valid trees. They're not optimal in any sense. They're not minimum cost spanning trees. If we sum up the edges on these trees, they are not minimal. Okay, so it's, we're going to look next at what a minimum spanning tree is. This is a tree that where the sum of edges is minimized. Now, if, if these edges represent the cost of communication, then it's a good. Then we would want to try to find a minimal spanning tree. Okay, Prim's algorithm is an example of an algorithm that finds a minimum spanning tree. Um, this starts with the root node and then looks at the frontier. So the frontier are the set of edges that go from trees on edges. Sorry, nodes on the tree to uh, nodes that are outside the tree. So here are three frontier nodes. And um, what Prim's algorithm does is, is adds the lowest cost frontier edge. So we choose the two here. And when, after doing that choice, the next iteration of the loop now has an expanded frontier. So you have to update the data structure that represents these frontier edges. And now again, you pick the lowest cost one, which is what? It's the three. And that expands the frontier. Notice it also eliminates part of the frontier. The six edge is no longer on the frontier because now it becomes uh, between two uh, tree nodes. Okay, and again we choose the lowest cost one, which is the one. Frontier moves, then the two, and then then there's a one, and, and so on. There's two here is on the frontier, and um, finally the two. So. This is a tree. If you sum up the edges, you'll see the cost of these edges is much less than the, one, the solution we got last time. We have a lot of low-cost edges. We didn't use this like seven or six or four. Um, yeah, so that works. There, there are other algorithms to do this efficiently, such as Kruskal's algorithm, which works in a slightly different way. But it also is greedy in the sense that it chooses uh, smallest cost edges within some some restrictions of which edges are available to choose. And this in Kruskal's algorithm, it like chooses edges that join to uh, two two trees in a in a forest, yeah, a spanning forest. So um, that's that's Prim's algorithm. Um, the trickiest part about implementing this. Uh, you're not going to have to implement it for this class, but the trickiest part about that is efficiently finding the minimum cost frontier edge. 
So we have a set, we have a frontier edge set that's constantly changing. So you can stop and think about how to do that. That's a good like um, leak code kind of interview question to think about. Although it's kind of challenging. Uh, well, it's like a, a hard difficulty one, I think. Uh, so I have to stop and think about that. I'm not going to give a complete solution, but basically, if you have a priority queue or like a, a heap to store the edges that are currently at the frontier and you've, you, you've chosen a priority queue that allows you to add and remove edges efficiently, then um, that's what you can use. You can always pick the, the minimum cost edge efficiently, and as long as you have a way to, to after you make that addition, you find the node that was added, look at all the, the edges, the neighbors of that new node that tells you uh, what the new what edges need to be removed from the frontier and what new edges are going to be added to the frontier, and, you, and you, as long as you have an efficient way to add that from your, your prior and remove that from your priority queue, you'll be you'll be good there. Okay. We have other kinds of trees. So th that last one I showed you had a minimum sum of, of edge costs. But sometimes we want something we want to optimize for something different than the sum of edges. Um, it's very often the case that we might want to minimize the longest path cost. Not the total, not the total edge cost, but the longest path. So, in other words, the root. If, if these edges represent latencies, so previously we were kind of assuming the edges represented dollar costs, like it was going to cost us a certain amount of money to send data across a link, and we want to minimize the total cost to reach everyone. If instead we're talking about time, and doing things in parallel doesn't like slow things down, because it, cost time is not something that costs us if we do it in parallel, right? So, the metric we want to optimize if these edges represent time is a little different. Uh, we want to mi minimize the farthest node from the root. Okay, so we want to have from, from this root B that we're broadcasting from, we want to have the shortest path to every node. And we can solve, we can compute that using Dijkstra's algorithm, actually. So we, we saw Dijkstra's algorithm before for finding the shortest path to any one node, but in, the, in that process it also computes the shortest path to every node. And this is an example of such a tree. Okay, this is not a minimum spanning tree, the total edge cost might be greater, but the, this minimizes the broadcast latency. If we're concerned about sending a message and these are times we want it to reach everyone as quickly as possible, what that means is we want it to reach the last person soonest. <laughs> that we're minimizing the shortest, we're minimizing the length of the longest path. Okay. All right. So there's a trade-off here. There are two different approaches I've shown for these sort of different kinds of optimal spanning trees. The one on the left is the minimum spanning tree using something like Prim's algorithm. The one on the right is the shortest path spanning tree using Dijkstra's algorithm. And I'm showing them side by side so you can see the difference. And they kind of look they kind of look different intuitively, and the numbers add up differently. So the minimum spanning tree on the left looks a little bit like lankier. It has it's like longer overall. More it's like deeper in a sense. But it goes across a lot of small edges, right? So if you're starting off at B and you want to get a message to C, you're going to move across a lot of small cost edges, but they add up over time to be quite slow, right? The longest path in this first choice is 13 if we go down here. So it takes a really long time for the message to get to H. But in total, the number, if you add up the numbers in all these edges, it's only 18 in total, which is pretty small, right? So that's what's optimized here. The cumulative cost is 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 optimized. Now, if these number, the, the key question here is, what do these numbers represent on your graph? What are you trying to optimize? If these numbers represent dollar cost, or more realistically, if if, if these represent energy cost, and you have some kind of mobile ad hoc network, like sensor network or something, you're trying to minimize the uh, total power drain to do a communication, a broadcast. Uh, you don't care so much about time. You just want to minimize the battery drain. Yeah, then this would achieve that. You know, if this is the amount of energy that's required for for the, these communications, it doesn't matter that it takes a long time to get to H. We did it in a. We were if we were patient, we can do it with less total cost. Now, the flip side of that again is if these are, if these if these delays are not cumulative, but instead they are, um, yeah, if they're delays, I don't know what the term is for that, but um, the general term for that, but then what we want to do is is choose a minimum spanning tree, minimum shortest path spanning tree, like with Dijkstra's algorithm. And this, with it, we're going to make very different choices. So we choose, for example, we chose this 
edge would cost seven, which is just would really skew our total cost. Our total cost is 23 now instead of 18. But the advantage of, doing, of that choice was it allowed us to get to F pretty quickly. And I guess maybe a better example would be this C, this C over here. Um, we chose this cost for edge to get there um, quickly instead of going in a roundabout manner. And so the longest path here, the cost is only 9 instead of 13. That would be the path to get to F, whereas previously we went kind of B, A, G, I, F, um, which was a path of, of 13. Okay. So again, two, just two different spanning trees. They're optimizing different things. The first one makes sense if your costs are cumulative. The other one makes sense if the costs represent delays and you're trying to um, get everyone in the data as quickly as possible. And, and essentially with parallelism, if parallel costs don't matter, then this is a better choice. Okay. So we looked at broadcasting. Um, this is not the, t the end of, of, of lecture summary. This is a mid midway summary. Uh, controlled flooding, and there are two different ba basic ways of doing it. Controlled flooding and spanning trees, actually. Okay, so controlled flooding was a, a more distributed approach. It's simple and it works. Um, nodes broadcast new messages, but they have to track messages that they've seen to determine whether messages are new. And duplicate messages may be received, but they're thrown out. Okay, but it happens with only local knowledge. Um, nodes never actually learn. For a single broadcast, the nodes in the network never learn anything about the whole network, right? Now, if when you when you when you use it to implement link state flooding, where every edge is broadcast to everyone, then you have kind of a a one to many across all the edges that that does transfer information about everything to every, everyone. But for a single broadcast, um, there's there's very little. Only information in the message is, is received by everyone, and not, no other information about the network. The alternative approach of a spanning tree is more complex. It requires centralized knowledge of the full network. But it's more efficient. Uh, you have a choice to optimize two different parameters, what, what, uh, whether it's delay or, or uh, cumulative cost. You don't need message IDs because they're not going to be duplications. We, we won't have um, any loops in the path. And uh, we, st we still retransmit messages that are received, but we, have a t we can carefully choose the n only the necessary paths to retransmit a message rather than just sending them to everyone. Um, and all the nodes have to agree on the same spanning tree, which is another way of saying that there has to be consistent centralized knowledge of the full network. Okay. So for thinking of internet routers, um, flooding actually, so these things are not like uh, independent of each other. You can use flooding to establish shared information that then later can be used for a spanning tree based approach to, to broadcast. So at first you, might, you can use controlled flooding and um, that could be that information could be used. You can use that to share information to create centralized knowledge of the full network and use a spanning tree. Okay. Another place where these spanning trees are useful are in network design problems, where you're building physical stuff, for example. So, like, let's say you have these cities, and you're a network operator, and you're trying to lay cables, right, to connect them. And we have a graph that shows roughly the cost to build links between them, which let's say is, is proportional to the distance. Or if we're doing, let's say, uh, or maybe we're doing radio transmission and the uh, distance represents the latency or the power requirements. Anyway, th in this scenario that I've, I've drawn up, you might want to figure out what links you should build to uh, complete this network as efficiently as possible. Right. The minimum spanning tree in this case will be the cheapest graph that connects all these nodes. Okay. There are other alternatives, but this is the cheapest one because it's a minimum spanning tree. Okay. Now, if let's say I'll, you could think about scenarios when you might want to have a shortest path tree instead of a minimum spanning tree. In other words, use Dijkstra's algorithm instead of Prim's algorithm. Um, what do you think about that? Any cases you can think of? Well, the only one I can think of uh, right now is is if most of your traffic is coming from one source. Like, let's say Chicago is a source of a lot of traffic, and everyone wants to receive that traffic as quickly as possible. Then you could build, uh, in other words, latency was your goal, not cost. Just like I was talking about before, then you could build a um, 
shortest path tree. Although in this case, what I've shown is also the shortest path tree. But if the example was, if most traffic was coming from Kansas City, let's say, then what you might have is, instead you have a different design where you have Kansas City to Chicago, Kansas City to Minneapolis, Kansas City to Indianapolis, and then um, Chicago to Detroit, Detroit to Toronto, different shape. But that would be bad. That would be bad for Toronto to Minneapolis. You know, you'd go like all around this other way. So that only works if um, there's a, a one to many kind of design consistently. All right. So today I talked first about different modes of addressing packets. So instead of just having a packet go to one host, we had broadcast, multicast, any cast uh, was a hack that BGP that with BGP that allows traffic for one IP address to go to more than one host. We talked about broadcasting as a way to send a single message to every host in a network. It, it's not used on the internet, but it can be used in uh, smaller networks. And um, multicast was a, was the case kind of between unicast and broadcasting where we have a set of, of hosts that are receiving a message that's greater than one. To implement broadcasting, we had two different ways of doing it, controlled flooding and spanning tree, which I already kind of um, reviewed. And for the spanning tree, we had two algorithms to implement that, uh, Prim's algorithm and Dexter's algorithm. And the difference was what they were optimizing. So Prim's algorithm was computing a minimal spanning tree in terms of the total edge cost, which is, makes sense if your costs are cumulative. Dexter's algorithm was computing the shortest path from the route to all destinations. So that's, that makes sense if you're talking about delays. All right, cool. Hope that made sense. And again, that is everything you need now to do project three.